And we head now to here to the University of Iowa in Iowa City, where Republican presidential candidate Texas Congressman Ron Paul is going to be making a campaign stop on this homecoming weekend at the campus. He'll be speaking at this youth rally on a two-day campaign tour of Iowa. Earlier, he was in Newton, Davenport, and Burlington. And tomorrow, he'll be making a stop in Des Moines to speak to the Faith and Freedom Coalition. You're watching live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Wow. <laughs> I'm not exactly Ron Paul, but I hope to entertain you for a couple minutes. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just like to inter er, introduce myself to you all. My name is Ani De Groot. I'm the Midwest Regional Director with Youth for Ron Paul, and on behalf of the Ron Paul 2012 campaign, Youth for Ron Paul, and the University of Iowa Youth for Ron Paul chapter, I'd like to welcome you all for coming tonight. You know, as a youth activist and a student who has studied political science for many years, I've studied the phenomenon that is the youth vote. That is to say, the historically low turnout rate from the youth. And, you know, a lot of people say that the youth are just lazy or maybe they don't care, they're not motivated um, to actually turn out at the polls. But I think this, they uh, find a problem in that they don't understand who the youth are. The youth uh, people in general have this inherent uh, urge to change the world. They have a passion that is instilled in each of them. <laughs> they have a passion that is instilled in each of them to change the world. They see the status quo and they realize that there are many problems with what is going on and they realize we must fix this now. But the reason that we've had such a learned low turnout rate in the past is because we've been given candidate choices that have failed us continuously. Each administration is the same from one to the next, simply throwing money at problems and hoping they fix themselves. You know, expanding the uh, empire abroad, going around the world gallivanting with endless wars of aggression, uh, continuing in the fiat system, ignoring all the warning signs. However, now we have something different. We have a candidate who actually offers these changes that we wish to see in the world. And you know, I hear it just so happens that this man can turn out a crowd with a thousand people on a Friday night in the middle of Iowa during homecoming. Imagine that. So I say it's time that we end the idea that the vote of the, you, the young people does not matter, that we don't have the power to change the world, because we do. We have the numbers, we have the power, we just need to get behind the candidate who shows that change, and I'm presenting him tonight. Pretty excited about that one. <laughs> um, so, so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, the University of Iowa chapter leader, Joey Gallagher, who played a major role in the turnout here tonight and the passion on campus, so I'd like to give him one more round of applause. It's an honor to be here in uh, Iowa. I'm originally from Chicago, so this is, uh, the most con this is the most conservatives I've ever been around, so... I truly believe, though, that America is ready for a leader that's uh, based on honesty, and principles. Are you, are you ready for a leader that's based on honesty and principles? All right, without further ado, the Texas Congressman, Ron Paul. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I was told this was a special weekend and not too many would show up. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I do want to uh, introduce my family members here. My wife, Carol, please stand. And two, gr two granddaughters, Lisa and Linda. <laughs> but, but it is great to see such a nice, enthusiastic crowd. You know, I give speeches on occasion, you know, in Washington, but I don't get any applause at all. <laughs> and uh, you know I'm very sympathetic to the younger people, those under 30. They seem to understand what liberty is all about so much better than some of, the, some of those individuals that have been in Washington way too long, and they don't have the vaguest idea what liberty is all about. But to tell you what, uh, I get uh, encouraged a whole lot when I visit with the young people, the college students, because uh, I know that the future looks bright when I meet with you. So I am enthusiastic. I hope I can encourage you because the stakes are high. The stakes are very high on what's happening. And I think that's what's happening. The people are coming to realize this. But liberty is my real issue. I do talk about economics. I talk about balanced budgets. I talk about foreign policy and the Federal Reserve and a few other things. But really, the issue is liberty. I believe our country uh, had been the greatest and the most prosperous because we had a better understanding about liberty than any other country. We didn't have a perfect constitution. Uh, but it's very imperfect now, not because it became more imperfect, but because the people who were supposed to be following it became less perfect, and they totally ignore it now. So we need a new generation that cares about the rule of law and the Constitution. But I think of liberty as being very simply self-ownership. Who owns you? Who owns your life? Who, who has the responsibility uh, for you? Uh, I come from a natural rights viewpoint, which is uh, similar to what Jefferson talked about, natural rights, God-given rights, that our lives and our liberties come outside of government. Government was not created there to allow us to have liberty. If we're going to have government, which should be limited, it should be precisely to protect those liberties that are rightfully our own. But certain things come from this understanding of uh, self-ownership. Of course, it means that it's your body, and people shouldn't tell you what to do with your body. It should tell you what you can do with your liberty. You should use your liberty, from my viewpoint and from my advice, is use it in a productive manner. I see liberty as the release of creative energy, and the purpose is to work for excellence and virtue, believing that once you deliver that responsibility to government, all they do is undermine liberty, and it ruins the efforts to be productive and uh, to improve oneself. But if when one is, uh, is convinced that we have this responsibility, it means two things. One, that you deserve to keep the fruits of your labor, which means there shouldn't be an income tax. Now that, that part is easily understood. The second half, half of it is not quite as easily accepted by some. But that is that if you have your right to your life, your liberty, and to your property, you also have to assume the responsibility for any bad choices you make, and you can't go to your neighbor or to your government to bail yourselves out. It's been pretty well accepted in this country that these principles mean that you have a right to deal with your spiritual life any way you see fit. 
You can ignore it and not uh, pay any attention to it, or you can practice your spiritual life any way you want, as long as you don't hurt other people. But you're also allowed to pursue your intellectual life any way you f see fit. We don't, uh, hopefully, uh, n never get to that point. We shouldn't be in the business of book burning and saying, no, you can't study this, you can't study that. It should be you that makes the decision. And for the general, uh, in a general sense, the American people have accepted this notion fairly well. Uh, far from perfect, but fairly well. But where I think we have fallen down, and this is across the political spectrum, is this idea that it's, it's your own body. That means if your spiritual life, which is a serious responsibility, and your intellectual life is a serious responsibility, why is it that uh, if we assume that you can have uh, free decisions there, why shouldn't you have free decisions on what you eat, drink, smoke, and put into your own body? Spiritually, we could argue that if you make a mistake, you have to deal with that in maybe another life. Intellectually, if you make mistakes, you have to deal with that yourself. But if you make mistakes on making decisions about what you do with your own body, you can suffer the consequences. But if you once embark on this notion, as our country has now for hundreds, not you know, hundred years essentially, that we have reneged on this and assume that the government will protect us from ourselves, a very dangerous notion. If, if the government assumes that uh, its responsibility is to protect you from yourself, it has to deal with every habit you, you engage in. And it is impossible to do that and still have a free society. The free society is a wonderful thing because I see it as o opening up the opportunities for creativity. But if we accept this notion that the government should tell us how to run our lives, the most uh, important practical, impractical result of this is that it destroys, it, de it destroys the productivity of all of us. It means that we will be poor. If you have this, uh, this idea that we should all be free and prosperous and do what we want on our own and be responsible for, our, for ourselves, we will be prosperous. The evidence is overwhelming throughout history that the freer a society, no more prosperous is the society. And that is what our goal ought to be. Now there there are many who challenge these notions, all the way from the extreme uh, communist, socialist uh, viewpoint to the extreme welfareists who believe that the government has to regulate the economy for the benefit of one group over another. But it does create the greatest prosperity, but one of the hardest parts for people to accept is if you have a free and prosperous society where you can use your own incentives to advance yourself, guess what? You don't have an equal society. And that is sometimes hard for people to understand. But if the results are that you have the most prosperity, you have the largest middle class, you have the best distribution of wealth, by far it is the best system to argue for and to work for. If it's government's job to make everybody equal, they're capable of doing it. Right now, they're working very hard on equality. But guess what? We're working on equality of poverty. That's what we're working on, unfortunately. Now, the, the free market Austrian School of Economics teaches that one thing, that government intervention doesn't work. It doesn't even come close to achieving what it pretends to achieve. But there's one other basic principle when it comes to monetary policy. Any society that embarks on the destruction of their currency, that is, by inflating the currency, increasing the money supply without anything behind the, the currency itself, and devaluing the currency, there's essentially always a transfer of wealth from the middle class, from the poor, to the wealthy. 
And just think of this today. How, what, what, what the, what's the main complaint? There's, there's a large segment who are hurting, and there's a small segment is getting very, very wealthy. Now, I see this as very, very important and also a little risky in how we deal with this because there are, in a free society, I said it was unequal, and there will be some rich and some poorer. But if, it's, uh, if a person is rich because they have been successful and because they have been voted to be rich by the consumer, See, the only democracy, of course, is a risky adventure. Pure democracy undermines the, the, the minority, and we don't want pure democracy. But in the economy, democracy really prevails because every single person that spends every dollar are voting on the product. And that means if we could have a society where nobody got special privileges, where nobody got benefits, nobody got the edge by government force and government contracts, and then somebody is capable because they're bright and they'll work hard and produce a product that we, the consumer, likes, that individual, if he becomes wealthy, we have voted him his wealth. We have voted him the wealth because we like his product. But if an individual becomes wealthy because they have an inside track to easy money and easy credit, and also when they gamble with this money in the derivatives market and they go broke, and then they go crying to the government and say, look, we're broke. If you don't bail us out, there's going to be a depression. Give us more money. If that happens, if they got rich the wrong way and then they get bailed out the wrong way, they deserve a lot of criticism. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have a lot of that's been going on for a long time. There's been everything from subsidies to special uh, privileges and special contracts. And, of course, we have uh, this whole uh, idea about how we spend our military money. That has, uh, uh, you know, enriched many. Buying weapons we don't need, enriching the military-industrial complex. But that is complicated by people being talked into for for patriotic reasons that you can't resist any military spending and that you have to endlessly fight wars if you're not and if not you're not patriotic so in order to attack that we also have to understand foreign policy in the foreign policy of a free society and a society that protects your individual rights a free society under those conditions says we as a country have a right to defend us if we're under attack, but we have no moral authority to force ourselves on other people, and we have no moral authority. <laughs> and we no, have no moral authority to accept this notion of preemptive war. They make it sound fancy. They make it sound like we have preemptive war because they're going to attack us someday and someday they might get a weapon and they might come and get us. So we have to go and get them. That just is open-ended. It's also called aggression. We are drifting in that direction and the world doesn't like it. We don't win friends around the world. What we do is we waste our money, we become more endangered and we develop more enemies. So. So we have to address the subject, and your generation will have to do it because this system won't work. I have argued for many years about a non-interventionist foreign policy, and I've always been convinced I will win this argument. We will win this argument. Our side will win. I wish they would win just by being convinced on a moral basis, on a constitutional basis, and on just practical reasons that we shouldn't be doing this, but we will win the argument about getting our troops home not for those reasons as much as we're going broke and we can't afford it anymore. The sooner we bring all our troops home, the better it will be for our economy. And this is just not bringing them home from the wars. We bring them home from the leftovers from the old wars. Why, why are we in Japan? Come home from Japan. Come home from Korea. 
come home from Germany, there's no reason for us to be subsidizing them. Now, as a constitutional president, I would be very cautious to be looking toward the proper procedure and working with the Congress. But in the area of foreign policy and the movement of military troops, the, go the president does have this authority. I don't even have to ask permission to move the troops around. There are no declared wars. So if we are able to achieve this victory, we can immediately bring the troops home. Instead of building more and more bases overseas like we're doing now, we have 900 bases. We're building more of these drone bases, just aggravating the people of the world. I would say bring the troops home, open up some of those bases that they closed in the 1990s. They closed bases in the 1990s. At the same time, they were building bases in Saudi Arabia, causing more trouble. So it's really time at least to get those troops home immediately. Let them spend the money here at home for a while. That would give us a bit of a boost. One of the reasons I went into medicine, because I do remember World War II and, and uh, Korea, and I hadn't decided uh, what profession to go into. I, and one of, the th one of the things that motivated me to go into medicine was the fact that I never wanted to carry a gun. I never wanted to shoot anybody. And I thought, well, I'll probably be drafted someday, and, and I'm certainly not going to play that game in war. And lo and behold, you know, I was drafted in 1962, ended up being in the service for about five years. but. The military draft, if you think of it, it's still on the books. You still have to register. It's always the assumption there, that position taken, to make sure that the government knows that they own you and they'll take you and put you in the military when they want to. So in a free society, you, don't have, you don't, not only don't have registration, but you never have a military draft either. We should be willing to defend our country, and, and it, it should be, you know, across the spectrum. Age shouldn't matter, sex shouldn't matter, if we're under attack. But this idea that we go and look for wars to fight because we're spreading our exceptionalism. You know, America had been an exceptional country. But this whole idea that we're so exceptional now that we're going to force it down the throats of everybody and if they don't accept us, we're going to bomb them to oblivion, and we call that American exceptionalism. I would say I would say that if we want to spread our goodness and our good values is become good and become valuable protect Before we preach to others and enforce laws or try to enforce laws in another country about practicing civil liberties, make sure everybody in this country is protected from, the, uh, from our governments uh, interfering with our civil liberties. That's what we need to protect. Set a good example. You know, they claim that we're in a war against terrorism, and they use that term rather loosely, because terrorism, of course, isn't a country. How can you declare war against terrorism? Terrorism is a tactic. It's a wicked uh, main tactic. Uh, Timothy McVeigh was a terrorist in that sense, but uh, because he was, uh, he was an American, nobody decided, well, we have to attack America because Timothy McVeigh uh, was, was an American. So this whole idea that we have to have a perpetual war going on is only there to make sure that we are intimidated and that if you don't obey exactly what they want, that you're unpatriotic, just like what happened in World War II. And, and the bigger the wars, the more likely they are to undermine our personal liberties. And just look at during World War II, how we had concentration camps for uh, the Japanese Americans. And once again, it was a violation of the principle, who owns that life? I mean, the people who were incarcerated didn't commit a crime, and yet it was assumed that the government owns that life and they can do what they want. The tax code is built on this assumption that the government owns your life because they say that uh, if your tax rate is 40 percent and I offer to lower it to 30 percent, the, uh, the people who believe in big government will come back and say, you can't do that. That will cost the government too much money. Now think about that. 
how's it going to cost the government money if I'm just giving your own money back or not taking as much from you? But it is based on the assumption that they own all your income and you'll get to keep a certain percentage under their conditions. So thinking about this as self-ownership of your life in economic terms or in personal liberties or the draft, very, very important. But we have gone, drifted a long way from that and we have been too casual about it. It is easy to blame a lot of different uh, sources and a lot of different people for this. We certainly can blame our government because they've been negligent, whether it's the executive branch, the judicial branch, or the legislative branch. But uh, in reality, government uh, it reflects what the people have allowed to happen. So it's a responsibility of the people as well. And this is why we need to uh, get a whole generation, plus many more, energized and an understanding of what true liberty is that we were on the right track the constitution gave us a pretty good start and yet we have drifted so far now we have a foreign policy we don't even consult with the congress anymore we we don't we don't get a declaration of war it's just so vague and now not only do we not uh, have we we don't have a president that even consults with the congress just think of Libya. Libya, oh yeah, it's a great victory yesterday and the president's bragging about it, you know, I got another one, you know. Uh, but how can, how can we be proud of that? I mean, uh, no matter how bad a guy was, whose responsibility? It's the responsibility of people of, liber uh, of Libya uh, to, to, to make their self-determination and deal with that. But no, we've ended up paying for this. It was our bombs and our weapons that do this. And believe me, it will be our burden. It's not going to go away. I mean, just think of all the billions of dollars that we gave to Egypt to prop up and pretend that we had peace in the region. Then finally, our pet dictator gets overthrown. And now it's more dangerous there than ever. And this is what we did with Saddam Hussein. He was our close ally and gave him support. And then finally, you know, we decided we had to change that. And uh, we did it uh, with Noriega. We did it with, uh, uh, you know, we were involved in, um, in Iran. Uh, they were on their way to uh, developing a pretty democratic system. So in 1953, we said, no, we don't we want you to have democracy. You might keep all your oil. So we wanted to have our dictator in, so we installed the Shah. And he was brutal. And then after, what, from 53 up to 79, what did it do? It stirred up hatred, antagonism, not only against the Shah, but against us. And just look at the problems. There's a, a long time ramification, the unintended consequences, the blowback from it. What about when uh, we were in Afghanistan, actually, uh, attempting to be on the right side of the issue when the Soviets were in there. We were actually on the side, the same side as Bin Laden, saying, look, they've invaded this country and we're going to help you throw them out. The whole problem is after the Soviets got thrown out, we decided it was our country and we were going to stay. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's a schizophrenic uh, uh, foreign policy. You know, I've always said that we have uh, only two options. Uh, one, uh, that we tell the dictator what to do, and if he does it, we give him a lot of money. If he doesn't do it, we kill him. Uh, and, you know, I thought those were the only two options. But if you look at Pakistan, they've actually come up with a third option. And the third option is, we'll do both. We'll keep bombing you and undermining and killing the people and making them mad at their own government because their own government supports us, and we give the government money. And uh, then we wonder why there's chaos in, the, in, the, in that country. But I'll tell you what, there is another option of all those, those three. And that is the one that the founders advised, that George Washington advised very strongly in, the, uh, uh, in, in his uh, farewell address. And that is making friends with as many people who want to be friends and trade with as many people who want to trade. Not to try to get involved in, in, in internal affairs, not to get involved in entangling alliances. I can't think of anything more entangling than getting involved in the IMF and the World Bank and the United Nations going to war over these institutions. So as bad as it has been over these uh, many decades of us slipping into undeclared war, it's actually getting worse.
because we went into Libya and now in Uganda with no consultation, no consultation with the Congress and saying, you know, this is the problem we have and try to make the argument it is for national security reason. None of that. It is just totally ignoring the people and the Congress in going and getting the permission from the United Nations and the troops going in and the money going in under NATO. This is a major step toward world government. And also, Many in, in uh, that like world government are very much aware of the same thing that many of us are aware of, that our financial system is very, very shaky and there will have to be a new monetary system because fiat money, money printed out of thin air, eventually self-destructs and we're in the middle of the seeing this self-destruction. So the, uh, most people realize that there will have to be a new currency. I know uh, a good way to get started on that. Why don't we look and find out what the Constitution says? It says that only gold and silver can be legal tender. That would be a good start in the right direction. But there, there are many planning that uh, the reforms will come, there'll be a new currency, it'll be a paper money loosely tied to gold, but it will be run by the United Nations. This is when we'll have to make a major decision on whether we think we should maintain our national sovereignty. You know, I think the states should run most of the government. The government was never meant to be large in Washington. <laughs> But over the decades, we have allowed so much of the government to go to Washington, and now it's shifting in, even into international government. But once again, we have to decide where our rights come, where our national sovereignty come, where our personal liberties come from, and decide what we want from our federal government. The founders, uh, literally, the colonists asked the question, what should the role of government be? And they didn't like the role of the king. I'll tell you what, uh, from my estimation and by others, the role of the king was rather minor to what the king in Washington is doing to us today. But there is no doubt this government could not be this big if we had not allowed the control of money to get out of the hands of the marketplace and out of the hands of something of real value. And of course that occurred in 1913 with the uh, introduction of this notion that we should have a Federal Reserve System. They do a lot of mischief and the very first thing that we should be demanding, which I've been demanding for years, and we got a partial of it done, that is they need a full-fledged audit to find out exactly who their buddies are and who's getting the bailout. And the fan, right, that is it. So you knew the next step. Very good. <laughs> but the, the Fed will be ended, uh, but it'll be ended uh, like when we have to come home from overseas. But the thing that I would like to do is help prevent that crisis from coming, you know, where, the, where we end up literally with runaway inflation. That is the great danger. The de destruction of the dollar, the abandonment of the dollar, in a rapid transition into inflation, and that, since there's no foundation to our monetary system or economic system, that could happen rather rapidly any time. Right now, we're getting a reprieve. They're still taking our dollars, and, and uh, the bubble, the bond bubble, and the dollar bubble is still building, but it, it should not reassure anybody, and it isn't because the world is in flux. All you have to do is look at the news. You don't have to go to Greece to find out the unhappiness and the, uh, dis uh, how, how disgruntled people are. All you have to do is to go to a few, our, a few of our cities. So uh, it, people are becoming very much aware of a serious problem. The big question is, is, what are we going to replace it with? Hopefully, we will have the right explanation to replace it with the proper form of government, the kind of answers that our founders gave us. And they wrote a document which was intended in no way to restrict you. It was written to restrict the federal government. But it's... But as long, as long as there is a Federal Reserve System and, uh, it, and it's allowed to exist, it facilitates the deficit financing. If you had sound money 
If you couldn't print money out of thin air and you had somebody that wants to spend a lot of money on an entitlement system in order to buy votes or a lot of money to be spent on policing the world to satisfy some special interests, we could tax, but there wouldn't be enough money, and then we could start borrowing. There still wouldn't be enough money, and that's when they resort to the inflation. The amazing thing is that uh, our government and our country has gotten away with it for so long, but the world has trusted us because we have been and still are, and we still are the, probably the wealthiest country in the world, and we have a lot of weaponry, so there's a false illusion that we'll be there forever. But now that we're the biggest debtor in the history of the world ever, that uh, we know that this end is coming to this and we have to replace it with something. So it is the basic questions we have to ask. What should the role of government be and what does liberty mean? Does liberty mean something to us? Are we frightened by it? Do we feel insecure? Do we want our government to take care of us uh, from cradle to grave and make sure that, uh, uh, that, that, that they will protect us from all, all dangers? You know, basically we're not safe because we have a big government. We're not safe because there are a lot of policemen. We're safe basically because most people assume that they have to protect themselves and one of the reasons we were given the Second Amendment, you know, to make sure we were safe. Unfortunately, in my lifetime, there's been a transition away from the way we one time even looked at our local police, let alone the federal police. We have 100,000 federal bureaucrats now who regulate us in our property and march into our businesses, and they're carrying guns. I would say those are the guns that we ought to regulate, they regulate the guns of the bureaucrats. But the, uh, even the local, uh, local authorities have become more authoritarian the way they uh, uh, enforce uh, what they consider the legitimate laws. Right now there are 50,000 uh, break-ins by police without proper search warrant that are sting operations looking for somebody that might be smoking cigarettes or making smoking marijuana. So they break into these houses and I read a terrible story today of, a, of a, uh, one of these operations they broke in and it was in an ex-Marine's house. He's been to, Viet to uh, Iraq. And uh, he put his family in a closet, so he pulled his gun, but he heard somebody banging on the door and busting in. So he had a gun in his hand, and the, the door finally opened the door, and he never sh shot a shot. He didn't even take the safety off to his gun. And he ended up with 32 bullets in his head and in his body. And he had nothing in his house. So what, what are we doing to ourselves? You know, yes, we take an oath to defend uh, our Constitution against all enemies foreign. But right now, I really fear for the destruction of my liberty and your liberty from domestic uh, threat today. Not only did the founders understand exactly what self-ownership meant, they also uh, translated that into seeing that liberty was a whole piece, it wasn't in parts. Today we sort of break it up, we have economic liberty and personal liberty. We actually even have uh, freedom of speech broken up into two places, we have political speech and advertising or commercial speech. But speech is speech and uh, freedom is freedom and economic freedom is the same as personal liberty. It shouldn't be mixed up. So we have to put that back together again and we have to have the, the confidence that a free society is the best and uh, right now I'm afraid that we're probably on the minority side of this believing that uh, only government can take care of us. So we have to have a new understanding and a new conviction that what we want to be what we want to have is to be able to live in a free society and have the right to our lives and the right to our bodies and the right to the fruits of our labor. This will give us the prosperity that we really want. And I believe that if you translate that into the proper foreign policy, this is what is going uh, to give us peace as well. 
If we can have a system of, of peace and prosperity, how can we lose, lose the argument? So uh, if, if, uh, if we don't do this, uh, the, the problems are going to get much, much worse, and there will be more undermining of liberty. And uh, in that case, uh, then it's going to become more chaotic. If we don't uh, do something about it and get a handle on it, my, my meager suggestion in the campaign right now on getting a handle on the budget is in the very first year, cut a trillion dollars out of the budget and get serious about it. I start with getting rid of five of the departments. There's too many departments in Washington. We don't need them. And I cut the, the military budget. See, I don't say defense. I don't want to cut defense. The military budget down to $500 billion, and they're nearly hysterical. Because in Washington, you're not even allowed to cut a nickel out of the budget, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, because then you're un-American and you do not support the troops. The one thing that I'm proudest about in our campaign, last go around and this go around, actually it's even more so, is the fact that I have been accused of not supporting the troops and that I'm unpatriotic and un-American because I won't support these wars. But when it comes to donations, I have the three top groups of individuals. You can look on the computer and put them in a category on what their occupation is. The top category of donations coming from individuals come from the U.S. Air Force. The second is the U.S. Army. And the third is the U.S. Navy. <laughs> so, so this whole notion that people go into the military just to go and fight wars, useless wars that aren't even declared is complete nonsense. They're willing to defend our country, but they don't want to just go to war for the sake of war. They think it's good sense to say, let's go rarely, and you have to go win it and do it properly, make a proper declaration, but make sure we really have an enemy and don't make it so vague. And that's coming from our military people. Now, there is, there is another candidate, and I'll let you guess who it is, but he's top in the polls right now. And uh, we looked at his top free donations, and they all came from free big banking institutions. <laughs> I wonder if they expect to get some special benefits from the Federal Reserve or just what? Another bailout. But uh, we... We do live in, in, in crucial times, and uh, we need, do need a, a, uh, a re-energized defense of, of liberty. We need to understand what it is, put it, put it back together, because we did have a wonderful test in this country. We had the freest country and the most prosperous country. We had the biggest, mid largest middle class ever. But it's, it's not there anymore. The middle class is shrinking, the poor are growing more numerous, the rich are getting richer, the small number, and most of them are making money off, uh, off the system. So this, uh, uh, this, this, ha this is being challenged. But we now had that experiment. We had, a, you know, a great system. But uh, now uh, we, we don't have that. And uh, it, if you think about it historically, Freedom has not been, you know, overly successful in that not many countries really enjoyed it. Even today, think of how many countries do not have real freedom. And, uh, and, and also, uh, the, the, they don't have, we don't have real freedom anymore, but uh, there are so many that uh, throughout history that has been that way. Most of history has been dominated by tyranny. And today, the Americans are annoyed and upset and confused at times, but I don't know if they clearly understand that the major problem is we're having less and less freedom and more and more tyranny, and it's going in the opposite direction, and we need to change that direction. That is my goal and my intent 
to fight for the cause of liberty to make sure that we have the maximum amount of freedom and the maximum amount of prosperity in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
welcome. It's good to see you again, Ron. Would you mind taking a picture of the fraternity hey, brothers? Oh, all right. Very busy. We have about ten brothers here with us. Hey, yeah, we got a bunch of guys. Would you mind taking a picture? Hey, anyone in letters? We'll have, we'll have exceptions to the rules. I get to write. Wait, 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 wait. Get down here. Get down, get down, get down. Alex. Your head's in the way. We really appreciate this, brother. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for taking all the time. Hi. Do it quickly. Ready? Duck, duck, duck. Take it. There you go. One, two, three. Alright. Oh, wait, one sec, one more. I just hope you're a popular group on campus. The first one was oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, very good. Thanks a lot. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, Ron, can I get a autograph? It won't work. What makes you think it's going to work? If anything, can you do it right here? At the bottom? Thank you. Thank you for your inspiration. Thank you. You are a teacher. I don't have a notebook. Okay. I'm here. 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 Quickly and I'm not, I don't, I can't stop. Right behind Sorry. Quickly, get, get in get a here, picture get a picture of uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Newman. I have a question. What do you think of our, co our Congress having 40 standing ovations for a foreign leader? Why do they do it? Please. Why do they do it? I don't attend those ceremonies. I don't know why. Thank they you, do sir. It. Did I get it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Can I get a picture? Uh, <laughs> well, we're not going to be able to stop the picture. Right. Or I'll never. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to just shake hands. Can't take pictures. Not enough time. Say hello to everybody. Good to see you. Very good. Let me get through here. Do you think of a way to decrease our habitation? Thank you for what you're doing, Dr. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you so much. Very good. God bless you. You're going to win, sir. You're going to win this time around. You can talk to them about personal rights for our bodies. What about women's personal rights for our bodies? Right. Good luck. Good luck. Okay. 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 Tomorrow, Congressman Paul will be in Des Moines on the second day of his two-day Iowa bus tour to speak to the Faith and Freedom Coalition. A number of the other Republican presidential candidates will be there as well, and you can watch their remarks live on our companion network, C-SPAN, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow.